So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, March the 11th, and this is episode number 150 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. And I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So guess what? It's 44 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and the bees were flying around in 44 degree temperatures, slightly overcast, looking for forage. That's 7 degrees Celsius, by the way, and there's a storm coming in tonight. Wouldn't you know it? It's going to set everything back. We're going to get 8 inches of snow. So we're going to wake up to a snowy, white, wintry Saturday morning. Silver maples are in flower right now, so they just started out, but we need warmer temperatures so the bees can take advantage of that. What do those offer? They offer pollen, and they offer some nectar, too. So I also noticed in the wetlands there were skunk cabbage in bloom down there, just starting out. So the bees have opportunities there as well. I'm sure they're going to find other things, but just in case they can't find what they need, I'm still putting out Ultra Bee Dry Pollen Substitute. And uh, that will draw foragers too. They'll get what they need to do because they're on the state of uh, expansion right now. So what else can I talk about? I think that's just about it. So let's get started with the very first question. By the way, if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and you're going to see every topic, line item by line item. First question comes from Robert. The question is about weaver bees, weaver queens. If I put a weaver queen with Italian bees, will they accept her? Thank you. And that's an interesting question. Weaver queen, Italian bees. When you're mixing bees of different genetics, sometimes the resident bees do reject queens that are strongly disconnected genetically from the line that you're putting them with. But I've found that if they're missing their queen, and that's key, missing a queen and not yet having laying workers. So they're queenless. They're kind of starving for a queen to move in there. So one of the things that you can do to improve installation of your new queen, if the queen comes in a package, queen cage, it's called, just like this one, they come with workers. And we covered this in the past, but I'll mention it again. <clears throat> the workers are there to sustain the queen in transit. So once she gets there and you're going to put her in your hive and you're going to put that queen cage right where your brood was or is, then uh, the resident bees are going to start feeding her there. One of the things that the resident bees tend to reject more so than the queen would be the workers that are shipped in that little queen cage with her. So you got to get the queen out of the queen cage, not the queen, but you got to get her separate from those workers that came with her. One of the ways to do that, there's lots of ways. <clears throat> this is a muff. It's designed so that you can take that cage in your hand with the queen in it, put it through the side here, come in over here with this one, and then inside this muff you will take that screen off, or you can pull the plug out that's in there and you can let the workers out, and if the queen goes out with them, then you have to catch the queen and re-cage her. So if the queen's out of this thing, by the way, and uh, the workers and the queen are loose inside that muff, I recommend that you get one of these plastic queen cages. These are good to have anyway. And then you just get the queen. You'll put her inside this cage and then you'll close it up just like that. Once the queen's in, you'll close it like this. And then up here is where you'll put uh, a candy plug. Some people stick marshmallows in there and things like that. But now we have just the queen. So another thing, and if she does not leave the cage, but the workers do, leave her in the cage. No sense trying to manage the queen. So then you will put her back in, and there's a candy plug side. That's this side over here. You would re remove that cork on that end, and then they would eat their way to her. Now, in the absence of the workers, this comes into play too, for those of you that are introducing new queens. If you turn it with that opening down with the candy plug down and the workers are in there, if they got stung, and it's likely that they could be stung through the screen and killed by the resident bees. And so the queen's in there, but the dead workers now fall to the bottom and they potentially, I've never had this happen, but we're failing safe. They potentially die and plug up that hole and then now the workers can't get to her and the queen can't get out. So with the workers in it, you would tip it this way so that that hole is up. So if there are dead workers, they fall to the bottom and the queen can still get out. But if you've removed the workers, and I recommend you do, because there's no reason to have them once they're here, once the queen's here, and once you're installing her in your hive, because that will increase the acceptance of your queen. 
Another thing that you can do to increase the acceptance of the queen is to take one-to-one -one sugar syrup. Make sure it's nice and warm, by the way. And add uh, two teaspoons of Honey Bee Healthy per quart. And uh, spray the colony a little bit. Spray the brood area. Give them a new scent to deal with, partnered with the sucrose, partnered with that sugar syrup. And it'll make them a little happy, a little distracted, and then the queen pheromone introduction won't be so abrupt. It's been proven to help with the introduction of queens once a colony's been queenless for a sustained period of time. Try not to let your colonies be queenless for more than three weeks. That's when you are the most likely to have laying workers start producing eggs, and all they're going to be doing is laying drones, but they establish themselves as the new resident queens, for lack of a better term, even though they're just female workers, and uh, they can attack when you put a new queen in once they've established and started laying their eggs. Question number two comes from Henry Waller, Dawson, Texas. I'm getting three packages of Italians for the first time and red. They can't defend their hives very well, so we should keep the reduced entrance on year-round. We'd love to hear your thought on this subject. Okay, so Italians, it's interesting that you said that the Italian bees can't, uh, don't defend themselves very well. Maybe they don't defend themselves very well down in Texas. Some of the hottest colonies I've ever had in all of my beekeeping years have been Italian lines, by the way. And I uh, had a fellow student at Cornell in the Master Beekeeper program that she did a test, part of her, because you have to do tests and studies and give presentations about your findings. So one of the things she did was to find out if different stock had different defensive responses from exposure. And uh, one of the things they use is rawhide, strips of rawhide. And then they just closely pass it over the top to see if it draws any stings. And of all the lines of bees that were tested in her study, the Italians, again, were the most hostile, the most defensive. But let's move past that. And... Uh, any colony that you have concerns about being able to defend themselves, uh, you can put a small entrance on. And this is something that I'm getting constant confirmation on. In other words, people that live in the South that do ripouts, cutouts, whatever the term, removals from structures, when they find the information about the size of the entrance relative to the number of bees inside the structure, the entrance sizes are very small. So, the consistent message is that even large colonies of bees can do very well with very small entrances and they can definitely defend those easier. But my entrance uh, that I've arrived at up here, and this is in the state of Pennsylvania, so you're in a much hotter climate, but three eighths of an inch high and two and a quarter to two and a half in length. So just an opening that wide and the three eighths inch height, and I think they can defend themselves well. That's enough for plenty of traffic to come and go. They're definitely going to dehydrate their honey and do all the work they need to do easily. And uh, it's defensible. Now, I talked to Jeff Horshaw. He says he drops it down even smaller than that. I forget the exact number, and I don't know that he me measured it, but all of his hives uh, down where he lives are going to be about an inch, if that. So even smaller is what they've done. So I think you're okay. If you think they might not be able to defend themselves, I would run that between... Uh, one and two inches, just fine. Year round, by the way, that would work. But as far as the, the Italians, wait to see. I don't know if they have any troubles defending themselves. Question number three, and of course, within the same stock, within, with the same races of bees, the same genetics, there may be variables in their defensive capabilities also. So they don't all exact, exactly behave the same. Next question, number three, comes from Kelly per year. And what are your thoughts regarding using food coloring in syrup as a suspender and belt strategy to know if bees move syrup up into supers with nectar or honey? I understand that with good management, the syrup is not available when a honey super is on, but as the bees have their own prerogative. So those studies have actually been done, and that's how they determined how the bees move resources around. They do use markers like different colors. Some of them use fluorescing particulates in suspension with the syrup and things like that. So you can actually look up studies like that that have already been done. If you put food coloring in there, it does have the potential to show up. Just like if they get into candy that's got the candy food coloring in them, 
uh, that's shown up and that's when people get this weird uh, material in their honey supers and it's colored. So if you want to try that as an experiment, you can, but it's already, it's been done and uh, it is doable. So if you want to do that test yourself to see what they're doing, where they're putting it, that's uh, kind of be, can be a fun experiment. And the second question here is, I've heard you say that the research for our region confirms the best hive size is the equivalent to one deep super. You've also mentioned that your most common configuration is a deep and a medium. Is there a reason you're not following the research on this? Okay, so I want to clear that up a little bit. And that comes from Dr. Thomas Seeley and others who have measured feral colony cavities. So this includes trees and other things that bees are attracted to. So what they did is obviously when they're moving into bee trees and things like that, and they came up with a 10 gallon size, which is what the bees are choosing. And they determined that also by following it up with tests with man-made cavities. So swarm boxes and things like that. Larger, smaller, narrow, tall, squat, square, and so on. Cubicle. And they determined that the 10 gallon size was preferred by swarms. So then that's roughly the equivalent of a 10 frame deep Langstroth box. And so that's the ultimate configuration for Dr. Seeley in Darwinian beekeeping. And uh, so we need to clear up some points just in case somebody is here that's new and uh, may not understand how that works. Darwinian beekeeping is for those who just want to keep bees. In other words, you're probably living in a rural area, so you don't mind swarming because that's going to happen for sure if you have a 10 frame box standalone. And uh, the other thing is the swarms need places to go. So this isn't something you want to be trying out in a residential area. So why am I not following that Darwinian beekeeping approach? And that's because I do want some other things for my honey bees. I want honey and uh, I do some testing and evaluating. So as that colony increases in numbers rather than lose the bees through a swarm, which is what they naturally would do. And this is what they do in feral colonies and trees. Uh, those colonies, some of those tree cavities are amazingly small, by the way. And uh, the bees populate them, they reproduce in them, and then once they get to a certain density inside and their resources are stored and there's a nectar flow outside, they split. The existing queen, the resident queen, leaves, and shortly after she's departed, new replacement queens hatch out, and it appears for all practices and purposes for people that are looking at that tree, uh, like that's been the same colony of bees right there for many years. But what's really happening is uh, they're generating swarms and reproducing themselves. That's what they're intended to do. That's why there are so many bee colonies around and that's why they still survive even though lots of them are dying out because of their ability to swarm and generate a new colony and that's what they do frequently in small spaces. And that's what happens in my observation hive which is only eight deep frames in pairs of, you know, four pairs of two. And all I do is build up, swarm out, build up, swarm out. So smaller spaces, more swarming. So I offset that and reduce swarming during the productive year by adding that medium super because I need it in my state for them to get through winter. Although bees can make you look silly because I also have single deeps out there right now coming out of winter that uh, were late season swarms that everybody says they will not make it. They made it so far, so far, because we still have to get through March. But uh, they made it in single deeps out here. And uh, so the medium super with about 47 pounds of honey on it is their insurance policy for larger colonies. And so in the summertime, I'll add supers that we take off honey for people. And uh, you don't have to do that. But if you do, just know in advance, they're gonna swarm after they build up. Uh, the problem also is where I live, we have abundant resources all year long until the temperature turns cold and the days get short. So that's when they naturally decline and slow down their production. The queen stops laying as much as she otherwise would. So that's when we pack down for winter. And so I pack down to a deep and a medium box. In some cases, I have two deeps because there were just too many bees and you can only pack them down you know, wall to wall bees. It doesn't help them. So it's true. I'm not following the guidance and the observations made by Dr. Seeley when it comes down to uh, a single 
10 gallon sized cavity. Uh, and that's where they find the bees when they make their own choices, but I like to expand them just a little bit and it seems to be working. The failure point for me has always been when I left three, four, five boxes on going into winter thinking I'd come out in spring with a supersized colony and those had a high failure rate compared to those that were going through winter in smaller configurations. So my sweet spot right now to provide resources for the bees to get them through winter, to keep the colony small and uh, not have problems through winter with condensation and things like that, no top venting, no upper entrances, single landing board entrance only, it's a single deep and a medium super. And that's it. Insulated inner cover, insulated outer cover. By the way, those prints are available to anybody that wants to see it or may want to try that out for yourself. And here's what I recommend too, because often brand new beekeepers uh, look at someone's configuration. And even though they have four or five uh, colonies of bees, maybe in their backyard, they shift everything to the new configuration all together all at one time. And I highly recommend that you not do that while you're learning about bees and how to keep them wherever it is that you live. I recommend that you have different configurations and that you see how one might do better or you know not do so well. And you can compare these other colonies. The more that you have, the more comparisons you can make. But unless you make these incremental changes, you won't necessarily know if you just had a good winter. If all your colonies come through and then you attribute that to some configuration change that you made, but you only have one winter to make that claim, that could be a one-off. There could be a lot of other things that contributed to the success of those bees in spite of the configuration change. So when you make, you know, little changes to your hives and practices and things like that, you'll learn. Because it took me years to figure out that my oversized colonies it was not the way to go. I just thought something else caused their death because it didn't make any sense. They had huge numbers in there, huge resources. By the way, they were the number one bees to rob out other bees, but uh, they had other problems. But yep, that's what I'm doing. And uh, hopefully you understand, first of all, why they make that claim about the 10 gallon size is what the bees choose. And Darwinian beekeeping is a live and let live practice of beekeeping. In other words, if they don't make it through winter, without those extra resources and everything, uh, then, oh, they're just not suited to this area. So then they work with the ones who do make it. So it's survivor line beekeeping, Darwinian, you know? Like they used to give out the Darwin Awards. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but you thin the herd based on uh, the ones that are just incapable of uh, being smart enough to exist or have the physical ability to exist. Question number four comes from Michael from Camsack, Saskatchewan. Going to do my first cutout of a beehive in someone's old building this spring in Saskatchewan, Canada. I was wondering if I find the queen and find queen cells, would it be worth doing a split? And when putting them in a hive, how many queen cells would you put in the new hive from the old cutout? And, uh, okay, that's very interesting. My grandmother, Grandma Dunn, is from Saskatchewan, Canada. Anyway, uh... If you're doing a cutout, the problem with that is when you're removing bees from a structure, you're not going to be hiving your bees and keeping them right there most often. You're going to have to load them up and transport them somewhere else. So keep in mind, now we're talking about you've opened up, a, you're doing a cutout, you find the queen, finding the queen is great, put her in one of those cages that I just showed, have these, have a bunch of these, by the way, just in case, and preload the candy. Look up recipes on how to make queen cage candy. It's uh, confectioner's sugar and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, you find the queen, you get her in that cage, and you get those bees into the box so you can transport them. Now you find queen cells, and for those of you who don't know, it's very rare to find capped queen cells with the resident queen still there. Usually they have already done a swarm and the queen that's resident has departed before those cells are capped or right after they're capped, just before, you know, they'll have several days before those queens hatch. And so the queen that's resident, the older queen is almost never present at the time that the new queens emerge from those queen cells. So if the queen is still there, see this is, I'm just explaining my thinking. 
the pupa that are inside those queen cells may be fairly young. In other words, they may have just been closed up in those cells, which means they're extremely delicate. So you'll hear me say this a lot, fail safe. So this is why you're gonna have to transport those queen cells. So you're gonna assume, make the assumption that they're in their early stages of pupating inside that uh, queen cell. And you can't, you shouldn't tip them. You shouldn't knock them around. Don't throw them in your tackle box. Don't stick them in your pocket and things like that. You wanna keep them in that vertical orientation you got to keep them at 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. You need to keep them humid so they don't dry out. They need to be ventilated somewhat. So the thing is that I'm saying is that it's a high risk adventure and to take those uh, queen cells and try to make a split right off the bat when you're just harvesting this resident colony from a structure. So I recommend that you just keep them all together into one new colony when you get them out and uh, try to uh, not try to use the queen cells because that can be hard. Here's what I do with queen cells when I find a surplus of them and I'm trying to requeen a colony. I get a uh, scalpel and I carefully cut around the material that's away from that. But before I do that, I put a straight pin through the top, which is all the heavy wax reinforcement there, then I do a cutout around it, and then I take that on the straight pin with the queen cell on it, and I come over here to the hive that's queenless, and I stick that right into the middle of their brood area and let them take care of that queen, and that worked really well last year. But that is from this hive right here onto this frame right here into this box right here. No transit, no anything else. But let's say it's a cutout, Maybe you're not that concerned about possibly losing half of them, or you might not be in that big of a rush. So now your second plan could be try the, try the comb that's got those uh, queen cells on it, but also install in that frame, in that box, uh, frames that have eggs in them to give them an opportunity. If something happens and those queen cells die, uh, it has to happen quick that the bees could then make replacement cells from the eggs. Or you can just not work with the queen cells at all, remove them completely, and then just have frames with eggs, open larvae, brood, and everything else, and make your split that way. And then, of course, split up the eggs, split up the larvae, split up the resources with the ones that have the queen, and then make a new hive with just eggs and brood. So they'll take one of those eggs and they'll turn it into a queen cell and those will be replacement queens. So that would be, to me, probably better than trying to salvage and carefully manipulate existing queen cells to wherever it is you're gonna finally be. But you could try, you could try anything. I'm just saying your chances of getting those queen cells in good shape without damaging the queens inside, you're taking a risk because by the time you realize that they are not going to hatch, you have no more eggs available for them to make a replacement queen cell with. So that's my opinion on that. You can mess it up in transit. Number five, Michael Pereira. In a recent video, you mentioned competitive advantage, MPD 15 markers. When I look them up, I see that they're enamel. Is this the correct ones to buy? And if not, who do you buy them from? So here's what we're talking about. This is the color for this year. Yellow, and these are the, that's the marker. Paint marker, competitive, advantage, which by the way, these markers are very hard to find when you Google search them, but this is not an enamel marker. This is alcohol based. And I get mine from Better Bee. And when you go, these are made in Marietta, California. And uh, that's it. These are my favorite markers. But that's where I get them. Better be. They are not uh, the enamel versions. They are uh, alcohol-based. Great for marking your queens. This year's yellow. Easy question to answer. Question number six comes from Michael Hall. Let's see. It seems regular inspections of the combs is critical. They seem busier than usual and there are lots of opportunity for them 
to build the colony right now due to the flowering of everything around here in central UK. I saw someone else in the United Kingdom commented that their area is the same, and I've just completed the second hive, so it will be in place today. Could some of the bees automatically go in it with it being five feet away from their original hive? So I'll answer that question first. Unlikely, but they can. I was uh, being inspected by the state inspector here in the state of Pennsylvania. You have to register your hives. Even if you only have one hive or 100 hives, makes no difference. You have to register. You have the potential to be inspected. When the inspector showed up, he asked me how many colonists I had, and I told him. And they were standing there looking. He goes, what about that colony right there? And I said, there isn't a colony right there. That's just boxes that I stacked over on the side. And wouldn't you know it, it had a bunch of bees in it. So there was a swarm, and they did move into a hive box that was just being stored or being ready to be used had comb, had everything in it, just no bees, but sure enough, they were in there. Made me look silly. So they could move in. It's unlikely, but if it's set up, entrance reducer, you've got your frames in there, the box is closed up, inner cover, outer cover, they're closed off from the weather and it makes this nice space. And once again, what's the most popular size space? A single 10 frame length throughout box. Uh, they have the potential to move in there, but you can't count on it. Uh, it's been determined that the sweet spot, the distance that bees like to move to, because just as when they're in the woods where there are trees and bees living in trees, uh, they tend to move, you know, 200 to 300 yards from one another. And it stands to reason. They want to spread out their territory and they don't want to overlap one another and compete for resources. So instinctively, their scouts would be looking for spaces farther away. But if they can't find any, look, here's one right here. The other thing is that could have come from somebody else's apiary. They could have found my opening and, you know, gone in there. Who knows? Could happen. Can't count on it. What do you think about the Australian beekeeper swapping the position of two hives when he splits? Is this something you do and is it necessary? It is not something I do, but I totally understand why they do it. So first of all, what is a split? Well, coming up here in spring, a lot of stuff that we just talked about. When you're looking at your beehives and uh, you're doing those inspections, seeing what their resources are looking like, and uh, you find out they're super populated and that they have at least six or seven frames that are chock-a-block with brood, that is a prime colony ready to swarm on you. So instead of letting them swarm, you can split them up. You can split those resources and put them in, other, uh, in another hive or in a nucleus box, for example. So that means you're gonna pull five frames. And you push all the brood together. So you will pull out frames of brood. I like to pull the frame that's got the queen on it if I find her. If I don't, it doesn't really matter. But this is where it comes into play and why they swap boxes sometimes. The box that has the advantage is the current resident colony of bees that's in that uh, state of increase. They're increasing their numbers by more than a thousand bees a day. So you gotta do something about it. You either expand it, you split it, and you move them over. So here's the thing. You set that other box up that you're going to move the split into. And some people like to take this box because it's new and it has fewer resources rather than the established colony with all the resources. They pull that one and move that to the new location. And they take the one that they pulled the resources out of and put the new box in there and they put it in the old location. So when the scouts from this box over here that has all the advantage and numbers and everything else, the foraging squad, the foraging percentage inside that colony, which can be quite a lot of bees, ends up instinctively going back to the original location, the original box. But you've put a new box there with the resources that you pulled out to start a new colony. And then the old existing colony has a new location. So they'll still be producing new worker bees inside. The nurse bees don't know where they live. Those are resident and everything else. So it's a way to get them to fortify the new box, the new colony, while the other colony starts to lose some of its foraging workforce, some of its guard bees and things like that. So that's why they do it. I don't personally do it. Um, I leave the resident colony right where it is. And then I put the other resources into another hive box and I move them knowing they're gonna lose their um, foragers for the most part, because they're gonna come back to the other colony because we're right there on the same apiary. So how do I compensate for that? I compensate for that by giving the new hive in the new location more of the brood. And then I leave the resident colony with maybe three frames of brood, and let them keep some of their pollen resources and things like that. But uh, they'll build back up because they'll have more 
you know, reinforcement from the foragers that come back and the colony that it just established will build up faster with more capped brood that will be hatching almost immediately and replacing their numbers and then building up and going through their cycle of duties inside the hive. That's what I do. Either way works. I understand both methods. I just leave the resident colonies where they are and I move the new ones that I make. And the success rate is very high. I try to take the resident queen with the new colony. Um, but if I don't get her, I just make sure that I get eggs and things like that. You still satisfy their instinct to reduce congestion inside the hive and to reproduce. Question number seven is Michael West, East Central Indiana. Thinking about bees in natural cavities versus bees in a human-made hive. I was at a beekeeping lecture and the presenter was adamant about needing ventilation. However, bees in natural cavities usually only have a single opening. There are also backyard beekeepers who close off all other entrances and vents to mimic nature with successful results. By the way, this is what I do. No top vent, no top entrance. Landing board entrance only. My questions are, how long do colonies stay in a natural cavity? Is sealing up a standard Langstroth hive uh, to have only one opening good for the bees in terms of long-term hive occupancy and ventilation? So it's proven to be so, but if you're one of those people, this is where we get into um, what you're doing with your bees and whether or not you're gonna force a colony to grow much larger than it otherwise would. And if you're gonna continue to stack boxes and things like that, um, single entrances have still proven to work in very hot climates, by the way. So single openings is what I've gone to and I see myself in the future staying with that. Single entrances only, no matter what size my box is. And uh, then the dialogue you have, let's see. Long-term occupancy, really that has to do with resources that are available, how healthy the bees are, challenges they face. Bees can abscond if they get overwhelmed with burrow mites, small hive beetles, things like that. Uh, but barring that, they're gonna fill the cavity that they're in, they're gonna get their numbers up, store their resources, and it's only natural for them to reproduce and uh, of course generate a new queen or series of queens and continue to swarm out. Swarm behavior is actually genetic as well. So not all bees will behave the same based on the cavity that they're in. So there are genetic variables and a propensity to swarm. That's why when you're looking up different bee stock, different bee races and things like that, and you start looking down their registered qualities, you'll see a propensity to swarm in there. For example, Africanized bees. Uh, Apis mellifera scutellata is what they're called, and they tend to swarm a lot. So their colonies tend to stay small. So their numbers are small, and they're, that's why they expand so fast for other areas. While other bees may be known to be less swarmy, but you have to have the space to accommodate those bees, otherwise they just get congested and they get defensive and honey-bound, and they have all kinds of problems, which cause a if they're honey bound and all the cells are full of honey, then the reproduction goes way down for lack of space. So if they don't swarm, what you end up with is low productivity, not so many new bees. And if that happens later in the year, you don't have a big stock of bees going through winter. So there's some complications that require you to be aware of your own bees, how they're behaving and expand or contract based on their production or not. And because there are bees that will jam their colonies, wall-to-wall uh, -wall bees bearded on the front, there seems to be no room in there. And then you look for it, they should be making queen cells, and they're not. So that's a colony that's not likely to swarm. And this is why it's important to keep records about your bees and what they're doing. And then uh, the rest is, and finally, what dialogue have you found works well to convince extra entrance ventilation beekeepers to consider or listen to more natural style ventilation hive configurations. Well, here's the thing about, this is about people, not just about beekeepers. Uh, some people, whatever they learn first is it, period. And it can become a personal thing where if somebody brings in a different approach that somehow they have to abandon what they currently believe in order to adopt or implement a new approach. So if the ego gets in the way, uh, learning gets shut down. 
So your job, if it if you get into a group and they don't accept something that you're doing or some method that you're testing out and they shut you down on that and build a wall around you and all of that, um, that's unfortunate. They should let you be, B-E-E, -E, let you be. And uh, you shouldn't really spend a lot of energy and effort trying to convince people because I found that even when you, what I like to do is find scientific supporting data for what I'm doing and then find a way to deliver that to somebody and then you'll find that some people never read it. They won't look at it. And there's nothing you can do. So lower your stress level and, and uh, hopefully people can keep more open minds and have some diversity in beekeeping practices in their organization, their clubs and their associations uh, because they become, you know, they establish these little divisions. It's like high school lunchroom where everybody's got their table and uh, they're all like-minded at that table over there instead of the band nerds, which I was one. Uh, you know, you've got somebody that believes only in natural beekeeping. Over there in the corner, the card table with the fold-out chairs is a flow hive people. They don't know how to keep bees. And then you get these people over here, horizontal hives, top bar hives, bunch of hippies over there. You know, so they break up like that. And uh, by the way, those are, those are not firm, you know, descriptions of those people. But I'm just saying people have a tendency to gravitate towards others who believe what they believe and practice the way they practice. It becomes a problem for me personally when uh, they put it in their description of their club, whether it's online, whether it's a Facebook organization or anything else, they'll list what they don't allow. And they may list, if you're a treatment-free beekeeper, don't even think about joining this organization. Uh, so it's really weird to me that anybody would close their mind to potential new information that could benefit beekeeping and beekeepers. And uh, it's disheartening. This happened at the Hive Life Conference. Somebody came up to me, said that uh, he told another beekeeper that was there something that I had said, and that guy shut him down and said, that doesn't happen, blah, blah, blah. And then he comes back to me and he tried to do this back and forth. And he said, no, no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. You don't have to convince somebody else that one practice is better than another. All you have to do is decide what practice you're going to implement with your own bees, the one that makes the best sense to you in your mind, and the one that brings the results that you want for your bees and for you. So convincing others is that's a lot of wasted effort sometimes and they just can't be convinced. And this is a mark of our current, you know, culture almost that people put on a jersey for the Steelers or the Browns or whoever, if you're a sports fan of some kind, uh, and they stick to that no matter what, and they make enemies over those who wear opposing jerseys. It's kind of like that. It's a weird psychology. I don't follow sports at all, but I follow bees and my mind is always open. I'm happy to hear some way that someone keeps bees because I want to know if it's working. I'm never going to close the door on the potential of learning something new and beneficial. On the flip side, of course, I, I might listen to something somebody says and not adopt it. That's perfectly okay too, because that's another psychology. That's another part of uh, the bee uh, community, kind of when somebody tells you how they keep bees, they're not just telling you that that's how they do it. They want, in some cases, for you to do what they're telling you to do, specifically when you're new. And then if you don't do what they've suggested that you do, all of a sudden, their feelings are hurt, and they're mad, and they're mad that you chose somebody else's method. That is something that I hope everybody abandons. <laughs> Just share what you know, and then let it go. That's what I say. But can you convince other beekeepers? No more than you can convince people on the street to uh, about anything, once they've decided. Find, by the way, find a group of open-minded people. That would be the best of all worlds. People that, hey, how's the top bar hives going? Hey, how's the horizontal hives doing? Hey, how's that natural beekeeping working out for you? Hey, what treatments are you using over here? Why can't they all be a part of the same organization? Why does it have to be shutting doors on each other? I don't know. I'm off my soapbox. This is my last question of the day, Susan Merrick. Let's see, it got up to 70 degrees for two days in a row, and of course I get nervous about possible swarms, although there are no environmental resources for the bees. By environmental resources, for those who are new, we're talking about nectar and pollen. 
I open just the top medium box to check how much honey is available. Three solid frames and two half frames out of seven, plus sugar on top. The sugar on top is an emergency. And you have to be careful too, because this is what happens this time of year. You can check a hive and they can have lots of resources, but what are the bees doing too right now? They're increasing their numbers. So they're increasing brood, which means they're going to increase consumption. And this is what's been weird. I've seen bees this time of year and colonies this time of year have, you know, 15, 16 pounds of honey still on. They look good. And then a week later, they have nothing left because just like what's happening right now, they're building brood right now. We got a snowstorm coming in. They're building brood right now. And then we get a bunch of rain that lasts for a whole week. So all they're doing then is keeping their brood warm, consuming the resources that they have, and they can run out. That's why I'm, I'm impressed that there's sugar on top as well. Keep your emergency feed on fondant, sugar, whatever you've got. This isn't the time to trust Mother Nature to provide for them when the weather's doing all these weird things. So a large buildup is happening right now. How full of bees is too full. I would do a split, but it seems way too early here. Even if new queen cells are made, it would be too early for drones and mating flights. Will a virgin queen wait until better weather to fly? So this is bee biology now. Um, so hopefully, of course, the colonies that are big and strong are also the ones that have the surplus to produce drones. Drones are male bees and they're going to fly out. They're not going to mate with the drones from their own colony. At least they shouldn't. Anyway, and uh, so looking at them when they're making those queen cells, then... I look around before I do any splits. I like to see different colonies producing drones, drones on the landing boards, and drones for freeloaders are all over the place. Once I see lots of drones, I get pretty confident that uh, they could be, you could be doing splits now, and they have a very good chance of being mated because we make the same assumption through the same environment that other drones are existing. The drone congregation areas are getting manned up and ready. Thousands of drones out there. And that's when you can start doing splits. So I would do things like pay attention to whether or not they're producing queen cells and things like that. Keep in mind. So it says, would the queen wait before she flies out? Well, she waits anyway, because the minute a queen hatches from a queen cell, although she's capable of waging war on other queens and stinging them, where do they sting them, by the way? Right in under their wing, right in that little opening, right on the thorax, it's pretty interesting that somebody even took the time to figure out where queens, when they engage in queen-to-queen -queen combat, where that stinger gets in. And it's right under the wing on one side. So anyway, uh, the queen's not ready to mate. And even drones that have hatched out, they're not ready to mate either. So they have to mature a little bit after they're hatched out of their um, brood cell. So we've got queens that are maturing. So now we're looking at maybe on average nine to 13 days before she can make a mating flight. So that may be enough time for some of the drones in the area to mature as well. So things could change. So you can have three weeks. Um, but as far as what cues does a queen follow before she'll fly out on a mating flight? Because, you know, statistically and based on those who have done extensive observations of queens, their flights and everything else, they only do one or two flights. And uh, they do all their meeting in those one or two flights, and they're back, and that's it. And I think most of them, uh, it was determined, do only one mating flight. So if they do that, they come back poorly mated, uh, either by too few drones or um, not mated at all, because they flew out and there were no drones. Um, you'll see that uh, you'll have basically a sterile queen or a drone laying queen that uh, matures inside the hive and never does, it, never does a mating flight again. So I think that uh, you should not be worried about making splits until you see plenty of drones around. And I think that uh, we'll trust the bees that they have a natural rhythm of producing the queen, that a new queen that needs to be mated will come at the time when there are plenty of drones around. I'm just, I just have faith in them that way. So it says, I'm hesitant to open the bottom and break the propolis and chill the brood. It will get really cold again soon. I agree. No reason to pull that apart. Typically nothing to forage until May here in our high altitude area of Wyoming. I've been watching you closely. I followed your hive configuration. It is really working. That's what I like to hear. By the way, if you want to see the current hive configuration as, as a plan that you can print or download and look at, it's on the website, thewaytobee.org. 
and also the horizontal high prints are there too. For those of you who downloaded the early versions, as uh, Ross updates those drawings, then I'm replacing those PDFs. So it's worth checking in on if you've already downloaded them and look at them again uh, to see if there have been changes made. And then you can download those too. All the prints are free. The Langstroth, Langstroth configuration, the horizontal hive configuration, all free for you, for you to use. Another thing I'd like to add about that is, and a lot of people have written me that they've built the hives, that they're in process of building those hives. If you do, especially that Langstroth design, if you build it and if you email a picture of yourself with the hive, I will start a photo album on that page as well on the website that will show you and the hive together. So you, your family, you by yourself, doesn't matter. I want to see your craftsmanship and I also want to see what you look like. So please be in the pictures when you send them. So anything that I've designed that you have a picture of yourself with and you want to uh, have that shared with the public, please send it to me and I'll add it to that uh, photo album on that page. So if you haven't guessed, we're in the fluff section already. And uh, the first thing I want to start off with is my shout out for today. Now I made a couple of decisions about who I should give shout outs to, what kind of YouTube channel. So it would be someone that either did a great job answering a question that I received, that maybe some, some area that I didn't totally understand myself and I would refer to that. But then I've leaned more towards encouraging our youth. So I'm going to continue that today because I came across a YouTube channel, a very interesting young kid. And uh, I'm going to say it's called Curtis the Junior Beekeeper is his YouTube channel. And he hasn't posted anything like when the last, within the last few months. But what caught my eye about this young kid is that uh, his dad was teaching him how to keep bees. But you can tell he's the one that's trying to build this channel. And uh, he has 14 subs, so he's basically viral right now. And uh, what Curtis did was he has beehives in his yard, and uh, one of them swarmed, and his dad's not home. So he talks his mom into holding the video camera for him, and he writes little notes in there that my mom's terrible at holding that. But anyway, he goes to collect the swarm completely on his own, so he's got his bee suit, and he's got his gloves on and everything else. I thought it would be a lot of fun to provide some encouragement for Curtis, the junior beekeeper. And uh, it means a lot when you're someone that age, because a lot of little kids these days, he's young, he's definitely elementary school age, but you can tell he's trying to do these things to the best of his ability. And I think it's fantastic if we could just encourage him a little bit, maybe with a comment or something and, uh, help him along. Maybe get more than 14 subs. That would be fantastic. Uh, kids can get very insecure, but he's trying to lecture and share about bees and they were teaching at the fair and things like that. So I would really love it if you would pop in on Curtis. The link is going to be down in the video description. Uh, the next part of the fluff is the cover shot today. One of the things that People always think about what to do because I've done this. You get out in the bee yard and you're looking all over for your hive tool. I've done the hive tool pat down to see if I had a hive tool. And uh, having them magnetized, by the way, this is a homemade belt and hive tool holder. All it is is two magnets that are just sewn into it. And then your hive tool goes right on that. You can put that over your shoulder, around your waist, whatever you want to do. And your hive tool is with you always. There's another option to that. You could, of course, in your bee suit, if you wear a bee suit, when you check your hives out, more and more I don't wear a bee suit at all. I just wear a veil. But they have pockets up on the shoulders. You could take one of those little, I think they're called rare earth magnets or something, slide that right inside the pocket, and then your hive tool is right up here where you need it, ready to go. So that's two hive tool carriers. One you can make yourself, drop a magnet in there. They're all magnetic. I haven't come across a totally stainless. Uh, not all stainless steel is magnetic and not all stainless steel is not. So if it's 300 series crest, corrosion resistant steel, that's non-magnetic, won't work with magnets. So then you're sticking it in your pocket, but I don't like that. When you take your hive tool and you stick it in your pocket, all the material that's on your hive tool, all that dirt and stuff goes in the pocket. How do you clean that out later? 
So I am a big fan of keeping it on the outside if you can. And having it in the hive pocket or in the suit pocket, I like the ones, the pockets that are down on your pant legs, for example, if you're wearing a full suit. But there again, we're putting dirt and stuff inside your pockets. So this one came from, this is called the Berserk Belt. This is by Better Bee. So it's all closed up and it's got these nice plastic clips on it, right? And this one had the biggest belt on it. And it has the same thing, no big surprise, that it has magnets inside. So there's two magnets, and they're both up high on it, by the way. So there's no magnet down here at the bottom. I've demoed this before. I like to put this on when I'm teaching people about bees and stuff, and uh, run them back and forth. But remember, these are the nice flat hive tools, right? So these flat hive tools are pretty sharp. The edges can be pretty sharp. So you can... Be careful, I've been trying to cut things with it before and cut across my fingers and things like that. Not everybody is that sloppy. But there's another hive tool design that uh, has an angle on it, just like a paint scraper. So if you've got a hive tool like this, and if you put this on your Berserk, by the way, just use this as a training tool. So we had a Berserk. You put that on like that, now you've got this sharp edge that's out. And these really are just model, you know, modeled after paint scrapers. But now you can scratch and cut your arm or you can cut into your bee suit and things like that. So this is interesting too and why I'm talking about it, there's another magnetic hive tool holder. But look how this one sticks out. So a couple of things happen with these pads that stick out that have the magnets in them. If you've got the hive tools that have an angle on it like this, it goes just like that. So now when you run your hand across it, the sharp edges are completely covered unless you pull your hand up into this sharp edge down here. But the other thing is you can grab it. You've got a space here for your hand with a glove. The magnet is strong enough, but not too strong. So you pull that up and the other thing is, and this is made by Be Smart. So the Berserk one is made by Better Bee. They're all available at Better Bee, except for the homemade one. But uh, this hard plastic material means that you can clean it off also. So you can sanitize this between bee yards and things like that. And I'd like to mention too, my thinking about the hive tools. And this has a little narrower belt, but the same principle, pretty much adjustable to any size person. Um, I've said to keep, you know, just leave a hive tool inside your beehive and then you've got one in every hive and things like that and we would reduce contamination. But uh, the concern is now, you know, the bees are cross-contaminating themselves by drifting to one another's colonies. So I would say let's fall back on sanitizing your tools between apiaries. So that's what the inspectors do. When the inspectors come around, they're a great resource. You can talk to them about things like that. But uh, yeah, they sanitize all of their equipment between apiaries, and uh, I think that's probably a really good idea. It might be overkill to sanitize your tool between each hive if you're going around, but you definitely don't want to see your thing all caked up with uh, propolis and wax and everything else and really be mixing it up one hive to the next. So I like to use two tools and scrape them off. And you can carry multiple tools on a single magnetic tool holder. So those are the options. Drop magnetic discs, gray earth magnets, which by the way, some of them can be really, really powerful. So watch out, smash your fingers. Uh, the other thing, and then of course, the dirt goes on your suit, on the outside of the pocket, your pants pocket, same thing. If you're wearing jeans, you can drop magnets inside of those and just slap this right on that magnet. Um, or you can use one of those others that comes on the belt and then now it's a piece of gear It also keeps your tools from being down in your toolbox and up on a belt where you can hang it over the side of a chair or something like that and know exactly where to grab and go when you need one So I hope that's helpful New hive tool. So two of those are available right at uh, Better Bee the next one, yes, don't back off on giving pollen substitute. There's one that's been proven to work really well, and that's rye pollen substitute, which is Ultra B by Man Lake. So I think they they run specials on that sometimes. Uh, keep sugar, 
or fondant on there. So if you've already got your Hive Alive fondant packs and things like that, refresh them. So do your inspections because now, as I said before, the colonies can go into this high production mode, which is a high consumption mode, which means if the environment doesn't keep up with them, you can have real problems with starvation at a time when you think you've got so many bees doing well. And this is where they can die from beekeeper error. So dry sugar is okay on top. Fondant is good. Cut a hole in the pack, put it over that uh, inner cover hole there. And uh, pollen sub out and about, that's open fed. I don't put pollen sub inside the hives because they're also gonna be foraging for other resources too. We don't want to dictate for the bees exactly what pollen substitute because the pollen substitute's not as good as the pollen that's out there. And silver maples, skunk cabbage, other trees are going to start flowering. Um, so that's pretty much it for that. Uh, thanks for watching the interviews that I've been doing. We have a lot more to come, and I think you're going to enjoy watching those. I appreciate all of those who have agreed to interview with me on my YouTube channel. It's a lot of fun learning about people beyond their beekeeping practices. And uh, that's it. I'm going to close out today by showing you some photos that I took recently that show how bees manage pollen on their bodies. So stay tuned after the close out sequence here and I'll show you three really cool macro images of bees. So I want to thank you for being with me here today and I hope you had a good Friday so far and I hope you have a fantastic weekend ahead and I'm sorry if you're in the path of this big snowstorm that's sweeping through the United States right now. I'm going to wake up to eight inches, so I'm told. So thanks for being here today. Have a fantastic weekend. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to go over three photos that I took yesterday with macro photography equipment. This is a worker honeybee, and this shows all of the hairs all over her body, from her eyes to her head, her thorax, and her abdomen. But how does she get the pollen back to her corbicula on the hind legs? Well, for starters here, she's running her forelimb down her right antenna there. They have a special adapted antenna scraper there with tiny hairs. And when they bend that foreleg, there's an appendage that closes around it and they gather the pollen from their antenna. Then to make the pollen stick to their body, look what's going on here. Her mandibular glands are open, her mandibles are apart, and she's pushed out a little honey from her honey crop there. And that's going to dampen the pollen and run it right back to her hind legs and get it to stick together. Without nectar, without some kind of honey from the bee, that pollen is not going to stick together so that she can carry it back to the hive. I hope you enjoy this quick look at some macro photos. Thanks for being here today.